Hello, everyone. This is Kevin Flangler from Proteva AgriScience. And here I am in my home office in Iowa uh, with the best smile I could muster, apparently. But nevertheless, trust me, I'm very excited to talk to you today about pan genomes for crop plants. So in this talk, I'd like to address what pan genome is and what a crop pan genome looks like from the perspective of an ag scientist company. I'll get into how to build and use a pan genome collection for a variety of crops. Um, this talk is kind of a sequel to a presentation I gave two years ago at PAG entitled Dawn of the Pan Genome Era. And we've made a lot of progress since then. A lot of that is due to the advent of PAC by IFAR. So the name Corteva AgriScience may be new to some, uh, but Corteva is the only major agroscience company completely dedicated to agriculture. It was born from the merger of the seed and crop protection business uh, units of these three companies. My ID badge, which first said DuPont back in 1999, and then later Pioneer, officially said Corteva in late 2019. Okay, so to improve the traits that go into a bag of seed, we really need to know and understand the sequence that underlies those traits. The best way to get that information into the hands of researchers quickly and to push it through all of our bioinformatic systems is to create high quality reference genomes for all of our lines of interest. Now, in order to support all the crops and all the traits that we're interested in and to accelerate decision, decision making, we need to do this in a way that is not only high throughput, but also robust and accurate. Because nothing slows research down more than uncertainty and incompleteness. The data really has to be actionable for us to work on. So we started using long reads for assembly back in 2017, and our first maize, maize genome took over six weeks, six weeks, sorry, two weeks uh, to assemble. Now we can do it in less than a day. For example, last week I made a mung bean reference genome in just five hours after the sequence data came off the instrument. Basically, we've had to become a genome factory to support all of our research needs. So what is a pangenome? So this term is very fashionable these days. You'll hear it a lot, um, and rightfully so, uh, because it's a very powerful way uh, to think about genomes. The classical definition of a pangenome is uh, the entire gene complement that can be found uh, within a species, but not found in any one particular representative. So this concept was really um, uh, put to full effect in this recent cell paper uh, where they create a soybean pan genome. They analyzed over a thousand lines and picked um, 26 of those um, to maximize the diversity of that collection. So for those 26, they created reference genomes uh, to build their soy pan genome collection. At Corteva, we take a slightly different approach. Um, we basically create a reference genome for each and every application that we have that is specifically catered to that application. Um, and in that way, uh, over time, we build a pan genome collection that's maximizing the utility for researchers. So it usually plays out the same way for all the different crops. Um, for example, the first thing we'll sequence are the transformation lines to enable our uh, biotech and genome editing uh, pipelines. Then we'll start to go after disease resistance traits um, that can't readily be found using the set single reference genome model um, because resistance genes are often novel to a particular resistance source. So we have to sequence the source. Um, then we start to sequence, you know, current modern uh, elite lines. We'll sequence um, founders from different geographies. And, and again, if there's a specific trait of interest, um, we'll go after it by, by sequencing the whole genome. And for some reason, uh, a quote from a famous movie, movie of my youth popped into my head. And for some reason, I decided to repurpose it uh, to reflect uh, my thoughts at this point in the presentation. So the main reason we've been able to uh, accelerate the process of generating a pan genome collection is because advances in these two technologies, um, they become so good that just these two technologies alone are all you need um, to generate um, an end-to-end -end chromosome scale, nearly gapless assembly uh, for most crop genomes. So those two technologies are packed by hi-fi sequencing and by nano optical mapping. These two technologies are really a match made in heaven because they're so complementary to each other. With PacBio, we're getting uh, very accurate uh, sequence contigs. And with BioNano, we're getting optical maps um, that typically span the entire chromosome or span the entire chromosome arm. So when the PacBio contigs uh, handshake with the BioNano map, 
um, the, these contents get ordered and oriented um, to create hybrid scaffolds that often span um, the entire chromosome. So BioNano has a lot of benefits beyond hybrid scaffolding, uh, which is why it's a required part of our process. And I'll talk more a little bit about that in a moment. So let's talk about PacBio HiFi first. I'm sure the basics, um, this particular figure will be shown by others um, at talks during this meeting. So I won't get into PacBio HiFi per se. I'd just like to just fast forward to talking about how um, PacBio HiFi has several key advantages that it's really accelerated our efforts in um, generating pan genomes. So what we were doing in previous years with PacBio CLR was, was very good. Those assemblies were great. Um, but the process itself was not really scalable to all the genomes that we want to sequence or for the ultra large genomes that we wanted to assemble. For example, um, previously with PacBio CLR, it would take three days to do a maze assembly uh, using Canoe, and that job would be running uh, on over a thousand cores during that three day time period. Uh, two thirds of that time was devoted simply to making just the corrected reads itself. So the biggest advantage to using PacBio HiFi HiFi or HiFi for assembly is the low computational demands for just generating the HiFi reads. There's lots of options about how you can go about that now. Uh, the best option is to get yourself a SQL 2 E instrument. Um, with those, the PacBio HiFi reads will be generated on the machine as the sequence data is being collected for the entire run. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those instruments yet. Um, so without that, there's other ways you can go about the the computational um, job of generating HiFi, you can either chunk it into lots of different jobs or you could uh, run it as a single job. Uh, but there's, there's definitely options of doing this, but the bottom line is that the computational demands are much, much, much lower um, than they've ever been before. So if you're running a genome factory, you need to also be able to, need to be able to assemble the data quickly and efficiently as well, and you know economically. So at PacBio HiFi, the sky is really the limit of how many genomes we could do at once and how large those genomes can be. So here's some examples of crop genomes that we've worked on this past year with PacBio HiFi and the relative genome sizes. Now the ones here at the bottom are a pleasure to work on computationally. On the other end of the spectrum is wheat. Uh, it has a very large genome, it has three subgenomes. It's always been the worst nightmare uh, for any assembler um, up until recently. So here uh, I created this table where I did some time trials um, on the cloud um, using HiFiASM for assembly. Uh, HiFiASM is very straightforward to implement because it just runs on a single machine. Um, so you can run this on a, on a large machine on the cloud. This particular instance type is a large, mem large memory machine that has 96 um, virtual CPUs. And when you uh, do an assembly job like this, you can assemble uh, a one gig genome in two hours uh, a maize size genome in five or six hours, all the way up to wheat um, in only 45 hours. So now really the biggest bottleneck to when you can get the assembly into the hands of researchers is where their sample is on a particular run. If it's the first cell, they can get it, you know, in a day. Uh, if it's the last cell, they have to wait, you know, about a week uh, before they can begin to get it. So the assembly process itself is no longer the bottleneck and um, being able to do an assembly like this so efficiently and quickly is really uh, a great first step toward being able to do a reference genome in a day. So I admit um, to being a recovering long read um, addict, like uh, many others, I always thought that to, you know, to truly tackle large uh, plant genomes like maize and other species, they really need to have long reads um, to tease apart the uh, many repeats that are in the genome. But it turns out the PacBio HiFi reads, even though they're not that long, the fact that they're highly accurate and they assemble um, with such low error rates that um, they can assemble maze, repeat, maze repeats and other um, large repeats in crop genomes because those repeats are often not identical. So one new phenomenon that we're seeing with PacBio HiFi that we never really saw before was we can truly get end-to-end -end assemblies um, for a particular chromosome and all the previously mysterious regions in between. So here's an example from a soy chromosome where we got a single pack bio contig that went telomere to telomere and assembled the centromere in between. And other features like large knob megatrax maze um, that we've always known existed, uh, we're finally being able to assemble those and we're seeing them 
and our Pack 5 Hi-Fi assemblies. Uh, again, with just you know, 15 KB reads. You don't need uh, 50 KB reads and above to do this. So one of the previous um, bottlenecks that we encountered at the dawn of the Pangino era was the additional polishing steps that were required. Uh, we had to use pack bio sub reads for polishing. You'd have an entirely separate Illumina data set of short reads for polishing. You know, those steps alone used to add an additional day to the process. And now I'm happy to say that none of that is necessary due to the high accuracy of hi-fi reads and hi-fi assemblies. Actually, as a side note, I don't recommend polishing your hi-fi assembly with Illumina data. Um, I know that some folks are still doing that, but if you really take a close look at it, which I've done, it'll actually make your final accuracy worse. You'll make more inaccurate changes than accurate changes that you'll make. And if you look closely at the changes that Illumina reads will make, um, the PacBio hi-fi reads are you know, unambiguously correct there, and the SNPs and indels that are being changed are just alignment anomalies you know, and other artifacts that you get when you align 100 base pair read um, to a complex genome. But one exercise you can do to see how far we're pushing the accuracy with hi-fi assemblies is to align your PacBio hi-fi reads to your assembly and see what kind of consensus errors you can find. So when I first started doing this, I would notice um, these large clusters of SNPs and indels um, in the assembly that I would notice when I ran HiFi Asm. And it turns out this is just uh, sort of a glitch in HiFi Asm where these um, uh, inaccurate reads were allowed to contribute, or reads that have an inaccurate uh, beginning or end to them were allowed to contribute to the consensus. Um, part of the reason HiFi Asm is so fast is it doesn't have a true consensus polishing step. Um, but with that bug being corrected with version 13, um, I really have a hard time finding any consensus error in my hi-fi assemblies. Almost all of it arises from uh, ambiguity and homopolymers that are greater than 15 base pairs or simple dye tri-nucleotide repeats um, that are longer than that. Um, and these are cases where Illumina data wouldn't help you with those either. Um, so yeah, so the pack bio hi-fi assemblies are extremely accurate. Okay, so as we've begun to build practical pan genomes for a variety of crops, some interesting trends have emerged and um, going through some of these highlights is an interesting way to uh, talk about um, all these different genomes. For example, cotton used to be thought of as a very complex genome to assemble, uh, but with PacBio HiFi, we routinely see that it has the highest contiguity. Um, in this particular assembly, we only had seven gaps. Um, each one of these bars represents a chromosome. And uh, these two green bars are scaffold gaps, and the other um, colored bars represent content gaps. And we're getting good uh, genome separation between the A and D genomes. So, um, you know, I, I noticed uh, talk titles at other meetings where folks are still talking about being in pursuit of the perfect assembly or being on the road to the ultimate assembly. You know, for a lot of crops, we're already there. Um, we're getting a single content per chromosome. And this really helps us because uh, there's really no place for our traits of interest to hide. You know, in previous assemblies that had high contigen 50s, you know, a lot of times our regions of interest would fall in an end gap. You know, we had to really dig into to resolving that. So the fact that you can get um, nearly gapless assembly out of the box is really um, what all of us in the assembly um, space have been working towards all these many years. So now you may be thinking, well, if I'm getting a single content per chromosome, why the heck do I need to waste my time to buy a nano? And it turns out that you know, contiguity itself is not all you need to know. Um, BioNano provides really invaluable characterization of your genome, your sample, your assembly, um, of the heterozygosity in your sample. You can get all this information from BioNano. And in this particular case, you know, we did get a single contig per chromosome. The whole reason we sequenced this line was to tease apart the sequence of a complex disease resistance gene cluster. And in our PacBio HiFi assembly, since we had a nearly identical um, 150 KB unit, um, it was basically collapsed in our assembly. And the, only by the use of our nano were we able to detect this um, as a first step toward resolving um, this complex repeat. So our nano is, is a required part of our pipeline for all the additional information that we get from it, besides um, increasing the contiguity by scaffolding. 
So in Iowa, in Corteva, corn is king. Um, so we've definitely devoted you know, most of our energy toward um, sequencing and assembling maize genomes. Our collection, collection has become quite large. Um, you know, part of the reason that we create reference genomes for every trait of interest, um, not only because that's the quickest, easiest, fastest, most reliable way to get that sequence that we want, uh, but in doing so, we really get all the side benefits and we're able to create a, a pan genome that other researchers can, can mine. So here's um, a simple visualization tool that we um, developed as a first way to start to begin um, to consume all this pan genome data. Um, here's an IGV based view that we call Panda, where we can stack all these genomes on top of each other. And it's very uh, quick and easy for researchers to, um, to visualize SNPs and indels and structural variation this way, um, whether doing market development or for analyzing any um, locus of interest. It's very powerful um, to be able to have all these genomes in one view like this. So in addition to being a long read junkie, uh, recovering, uh, I've also always been overly enamored with content gen 50. Uh, when we used to have assemble funds, the whole goal was to you know, increase the content gen 50. Uh, PacBio used to have a club called the One Megabase Content Club, which used to be a sign or a benchmark of having a good assembly. Now with PacBio Hi-Fi, really the only limit or the major limit to um, the content gen 50 is simply the size of the chromosomes. So to be the content gen 50 champ, as Pearl Millet is, with a content gen 50 of 129 megabases, you need to have long chromosomes, which it does. Um, and again, we're getting this from only 15 KB reads, which is quite remarkable. So similarly, to have the largest bionano map N50, um, you need to have uh, long chromosomes. And Sunflower is our current uh, champion in that regard for bionano map content gen 50. So if you're going to have uh, winners in the Contig 50 end department, you're going to have some species that fall to the bottom. And for some reason, that's always been canola. Um, we've done, uh, you know, over four CLR assemblies and six hi-fi assemblies. Um, and it's always the same story where uh, canola has uh, a relatively small Contig N50. And I've always been curious as to exactly why that is and how we can go about improving it. So that sort of raises the question of, you know, if repeats aren't really causing um, content breaks in our pack by high fi assemblies, what is? So it's really two main things. Um, it turns out that um, pack by high fi currently has um, an issue sequencing uh, GAN repeat units. This is an issue that pack bio is aware of and they're working on, hopefully we'll fix soon. But if you align your pack by high fi data to your scaffolded assembly, you find a bunch of one, two, three KB um, gaps. And at those gap sites, you'll find a lack or a real drop um, in pack bio hi fi coverage, which produces a gap. Another source of gaps um, is actually sort of counterintuitive. Uh, there's a bunch of overlapping contigs um, in pack bio hi fi assemblies. This has always been a thorn in my side as a professional assembler. I spend a lot of time mainly curating our genomes um, to resolve these overlapping contigs. In fact, I've given whole presentations about this issue at bio nano users group meetings and things like that. Because um, it's such a problem. If your goal um, is to create um, as good as assemblies as possible, where true structural variation can be distinguished from assembly error or assembly artifacts. So in this case, um, overlapping contigs actually creates an artificial tandem duplication that gets denoted as a 13 base pair end gap um, when these contigs go through the bio-nano hybrid scaffolding process. But um, I'm happy to report that I've noticed this magical button just appeared in the latest software release, software release from bio-nano, and I wasn't expecting it, and I was very happy to see it and to begin to put it to the test. But this is what folks have been clamoring for for years. It's for the overlapping contigs um, to be addressed during the hybrid scaffolding process, which is really the best time to do it um, it's not so easy just to look for overlapping contigs because lots of contigs will overlap because the ends are often repetitive, but you want to know that those two contigs overlap in physical space, which is what you get from bio nano mapping. So uh, here's a test that I recently did um, with the maze hi-fi assembly had 16 overlapping contigs of various sizes. Some of those overlaps are quite large, um, you know, 200 KB overlap and the creation of an artificial 
um, 200 kb tan duplication is something that you want to address. Um, usually I do that through manual curation. Uh, but now with the use of the magic button, um, in this test, all 16 of these overlaps um, were auto trimmed, which meant that no manual curation was needed. And I didn't really, I didn't need to run the hybrid scaffolding process twice. Um, so what this process does um, is it trims contents based on map space, not on sequence. That's an important distinction to know. So uh, however much of an overlap is detected in map space, um, that many base pairs will be trimmed um, from the content on the right. So sometimes that might not be ideal. Sometimes you could tell that's a content on the left that's better to trim, but that's a good trade-off to have this automated process that saves a lot of time. There are a few cons that I should mention that I've noticed. The first con is that the final visualization will still show these untrimmed contigs. So it's not immediately clear what the fate of this overlap was. Um, but if you dig into files, you can see that the fate was that, you know, a 16.9 KB chunk was cut um, and put into um, the unscaffolded leftovers. So that is sort of another con is that um, when I do manual creation, I'll remove that 16.9 KB chunk that I cut to remove it from the assembly. So when you start to do annotation or alignment, um, this will still show up as sort of a repetitive region. Um, and also uh, the resolution of this or uh, the accuracy of this cut will be largely based on the number of labels that are in the region. So the resolution of BioNano is highest when there's a bunch of labels nearby. Um, so the cut is made, made based on map space. Um, so if you have few labels, the accuracy of that cut, the precision of that cut might not be as high as it could be. But this is definitely uh, a very positive step because um, a lot of folks don't do manual creation, um, but towards the end goal of creating you know, nearly gapless assemblies whenever we can. So back to the mystery of canola. Um, it turns out that canola does have a lot of uh, GAN repeats in it, which explains why um, the pack bio hi fi assemblies uh, weren't as contiguous as you might think. So one thing you can do is if you have an existing, existing CLR data set, you can use it to supplement your hi fi assembly. Now I'm not recommending that um, you routinely generate these two different um, pack bio data types for your assembly because uh, you know a contig uh, or a chromosome with only eight contigs um, is highly usable for, for most applications. But again, if your goal is to create a, a gapless assembly, which is the goal of a lot of pan-genome uh, projects, or if you have a very important line that you've been trying to work on over the years, um, you can uh, do this method that I'm about to describe. Uh, so you want most of your assembly or almost all of your assembly to be found from pack bio hi fi but you can look for chunks in your assembly or um, if you have to uh, correct the CLR reads that span these GA and repeats um, or span an overlap. And you can put those chunks, um, add them to your hi-fi reads and redo the assembly and voila, um, hi fi asm will now assemble it into one contact with zero gaps. So there's a lot of advantage, advantages to doing things this way. I've never been a big fan of gap filling um, per se because you don't really know uh, what the fate of that gap fill will be. Um, you could fill a gap um, and not have it be filled correctly, or you could actually fill an overlapping content gap and have it not be um, filled correctly. So when you put these chunks through the rigors of the assembly process, um, you know, those chunks will be corrected by hi-fi reads um, and, and they have to go through the rigors of assembly. So you won't get a false, um, a false assembly doing, this, doing things this way. So in this case, I was able to increase the contig N50 of canola from 10 to 30 megabases, which works out to be about two contigs per chromosome. Um, so you can see how there'll be an explosion in contig N50s again, uh, once this GAN issue is resolved by PAC bio. Uh, and you can see that really it's not repeats that are, are stopping contigs, it's really these two issues. Um, okay, so I've done that process for several of our key um, lines um, for maize and for other crops. But here's an example where I was able to um, do this process and get a maize assembly that only has uh, 12 total gaps at the assembly, nine scaffold gaps, three content gaps. Um, and this is really the culmination of what uh, we've been working toward for the past few years um, to try to get our maize assemblies as gapless as possible. And here's an example of uh, for a couple 
chromosomes of what that looks like. So for example, chromosome five, we got into a single contig. Chromosome six was in, um, had one contig gap and two scaffold gaps. And if you look at the gaps that are remaining, they're really in or adjacent to really the nastiest of uh, centromeric repeats. You know, these are regions where the repeats were probably not identical and HIFI wasn't able to, to tease them apart. So we've really pushed maze almost as far as we can go, um, which is really exciting when we're doing so many maze genomes. So I've been hoping to talk about wheat for a while. Um, to build a pan genome for wheat, um, really you have to start someplace and build that first you know, long read assembly for wheat. Um, you know, there's alumina-based assemblies for wheat um, that have a lot of gaps in them, but really the goal is to come up with a way, come up with a process um, to generate a wheat pan genome. So we're currently in the middle of doing our first uh, wheat genome, and we found some interesting things. Um, so for our first go at, we got a contig N50 of 22 megabases and a map N50 of 35 megabases. Uh, these are two areas that we're hoping to improve with a version two. Um, you know, our PacBio or HiFi data set only had 13, 14 KB reads. Uh, we think improving that um, will help a lot. We've seen that for other large genomes like OAT. Having 16 KB reads really helps. Um, for other wheat bio nanomass that we've made, we've had a map N50s of uh, around 50 megabases. So we think there's some room, room improvement, room for improvement there, um, particularly if we can develop a highly optimized molecule set for assembly. You know, we might be able to push that even beyond a uh, 50 megabase map N50. And nevertheless, when you put these two together, uh, we do get a, a, a pretty good uh, assembly for wheat. Uh, we were very happy, uh, but we noticed one interesting phenomenon that all of the uh, B genome chromosomes were much more highly fragmented into more scaffolds than um, the A and D genomes. So all of the A and D genomes only had a handful of scaffolds per chromosome, but the B genomes curiously had much more. Um, so we started to dig into that, and we think that the issue arises um, with the bio nanomaps. So for the, all the wheat bio nanomaps we've created, um, interestingly, the B genomes, uh, for whatever reason, had many more maps. So to truly get um, a great wheat assembly and start to turn the crank on wheat, um, we need to figure out what is going on here and try to find a way um, to increase the contiguity of our bio nanomaps for the, um, the B genomes. And we're working on that now. So uh, when I look at all these crops that we've worked on, uh, my favorite uh, by far is soy. It's a very nice, well-behaved, small uh, one gigabase genome that requires only one PAC bio cell uh, for sequencing. With that, you get the optimal 25 to 30 X PAC bio high five for sequencing. Uh, it's very easy to create a soy pan, pan genome very quickly. You could do eight genomes on a single PAC bio run. Uh, we typically get one to two scaffolds per chromosome and only you know, around three to four contacts per chromosome. So when you can build um, a robust uh, pan genome for a given crop so quickly, uh, you can readily jump into some interesting views and you can start to look for you know, chromosome scale, structural variation, and uh, presence absence variation. Now the structural variation can be very important for a lot of breeding applications. So we're not just you know, looking at these genomes and cataloging SV as just you know, curiosities. You know, here's the example of a 1.8 megabase inversion um, that's present in many lines, but not all, um, out of these 13 soy assemblies that were lining up in this tag dots view. Um, but these types of structural uh, features can have very important implications for breeding. So if we're trying to integrate a trait um, into a line that has an inversion like this, it could be very problematic. Um, so one of the reasons that we're generating genome assemblies for some crops um, is to look for these sorts of structural variants that could have um, very important implications for breeding. So again, you know, we're not um, uh, doing these, these pan-genome studies for nothing. We're, we're uh, really trying to do this for practical reasons, uh, many of which I can't get into. But one interesting case um, arose several years ago when I first gave um, the talk at PAG talking about the dawn of the pan genome era. I showed a slide that looked like this. Um, as we start to generate our first pan genome for maize, one thing that struck out um, to us immediately in the second maize genome line that we sequenced um, was a large chromosome two inversion that spanned a third of the chromosome. 
So at first we thought this was a misassembly. Um, we knew that maize was very diverse. But we weren't expecting to find such a large SV in one of our most important inbreds. Um, so surprising to find it and surprising that it had gone undetected all these years. Um, but we had a really cool paper that came out recently where we were able to um, reinvert uh, that inversion, so to speak, um, using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, we're currently analyzing those plants to see the, the full impact of doing that. But this opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities, not for gene editing, but for genome editing. Being able to uh, flip these large pieces around, we can really control um, uh, recombination in any region that we want. So uh, this opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for us. And this was a neat thing that arose um, from the very early days of our pan genome efforts. And the discoveries like this are just starting to uh, bear fruit for us at Corteva. So not only have we been generating pan genomes for ourselves, uh, but we also do this as a surface service. We are certified PacBio and BioNano service providers, and um, we'd be more than happy to generate a pan genome for you. Um, just contact us through um, either of these two sources. Um, and the reason we're able to do that is because we have an amazing uh, group of folks at uh, the Corteva Genomics Group that in addition to doing many other things, um, support our, our bio nano and pack bio efforts. Um, so here's some of those folks. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, end and I'm glad that you were able to join me today as I talked about pan genomes for crop plants. Thank you. <laughs>